In addition to vectors, another type of object that R is aware of is a matrix. Why would we ever care about a matrix? Well, if you think about a data set, it has rows and columns. A standard data set, a conventional data set, is a rectangle that has rows and columns, and we can think about that as a matrix. So in R, we can make matrices, and first we're going to talk about matrix operations, what you do with these matrices, and then we'll talk about what you do with a data set and how that relates to matrices. So the function to make a matrix in R is just called matrix, and it's a function, so it has inputs, and then the output is a matrix. The inputs um, can be expressed in a few different ways, but one way to do it is for the first argument just to contain some value that you want to put everywhere in your matrix. So I want to make a matrix where every value is equal to number three. So I just write a three here. I want my matrix to have two rows and two columns. So I'm going to specify the second argument and row should be equal to two and the third argument and call should also be equal to two. I'm going to make this matrix. I'm going to give it a name, specifically mat one. And then when I type in mat one, you can see what I have is a matrix that consists of two rows, two columns, and the number three everywhere. Now you don't always want to have the number three everywhere, so I could maybe replace that mat one by um, giving different information the name mat one. I could make a matrix that also has two rows and two columns, but now I want to fill it in with the numbers from one to four. So the input, the first argument here, the first um, thing I'm going to give this matrix function is a vector consisting of the numbers from one to four. If I run that and then type it in, you can see I now have the numbers from one to four. Importantly, when R uses a vector to fill in the values in a matrix, it does it down the columns. So it goes one, two, three, four, and you can change that if you want, but it's important to know that that's the default. Once I have a matrix, I can find out things about the matrix. So just like I could take the length of a vector, I could find the dimension of a matrix. This is a function dimension, dim, where the input is a matrix and the output is the number of rows and the number of columns. If I'm only interested in the number of rows or only interested in the number of columns, I can use the function n row or the function n call. Just like I could use hard brackets to get subsets of vectors, I can also use hard brackets to get subsets of matrices, and this turns out to be crucial. Suppose that I want to access the first element of mat1, the matrix called mat1. I want the value that's in the first row, first column. The way I do that is I write mat1, and then I write the brackets, because this is going to be mat1 where a certain thing is true. Now, instead of just specifying that I want, for example, the sixth element of a vector, I have to specify which row I want and also which column I want. I have to do both. So I'm going to tell R that I want mat1 first row, first column. If I run that, it gives me back the number one, and indeed, number one is what's in the first row, first column of mat one. I can also access an entire column or entire row of a matrix. How do I do that? Well, when I say mat one where blank comma one, what that does is it gives me all the rows but only column one. So again, remember that within these brackets, you specify which rows you want before the comma and which columns you want after the comma. But if you leave blank the part to specify which rows you want, it'll give you all the rows and the first column here. So here I did that. And so if you look at this matrix mat one, it gave me both rows and the first column and the values there make up a vector of the numbers one, two, and that's what printed out, a vector of the numbers one, two. If I want the first row in all the columns, I do the opposite. I tell it I want first row, comma, leave it blank. That means give me all the columns. That'll give me the vector of the numbers 1, 3, and indeed that is what is here in the first row. You can also give row names or column names to your matrices. One way to do that is to say row names mat1, and then set that equal to a vector that contains in quotes, the words you'd like to use as the labels for row one. This will generate an error if the number of words you specify here is different than the number of rows in your matrix. But if I do this and then print out my matrix again, you can see now instead of these kind of generic labels, now the rows are labeled row one and row two. Similarly, I can give the columns names. And if I print out my matrix again, now my matrix has row names and column names. Now that my matrix has row names and column names, I can view them. So I could say, tell me what the row names of mat1 are, and it'll remind me that they're row1 and row2. And similarly, I can see the column names of mat1. The call names function is particularly useful because when you open up a data set and you're interested in knowing what the names of all the variables are, those are the column names. 
Note that once I give column names to my matrix or row names to my matrix, instead of just referring to the rows and columns by their numbers, I can refer to them by their names. So earlier I could look at um, all the values in the first column of my matrix by writing mat bracket comma one. But now that the first column has a name, instead of just writing this one, I could just write the name of the column. And this is very helpful when you're dealing with a data set um, where you don't feel like memorizing what order the variables are in. You can just refer to the variables by name. And so if I do this, it's going to give me um, the values that appear in column one, the numbers one and two. And since in this case the rows also have names, it's keeping those row name labels, um, which is very helpful. Here I've made a vector that I've called vec4, um, and vec4 has eight values in it. I've purposely pressed return and the space bar a bunch of times here to show you that um, R can run this whole line at once, as long as there's just white space. It's okay to continue something on the next line if you're taking up too much room. Um, you know, I can close the parentheses in the next line, as long as there's just white space in between. Another thing you can see here is that R knows um, some certain symbols in R, so pi, if I run just that part in R, R knows that pi is equal to 3.14, etc. So I can run this vector and see that vec4 is equal to the numbers 100, 2, 3, 3.14, 1, 3, 4, 3.14. And also this is what I was referring to with these vectors. Because this, um, this vector has eight values in it and R didn't have room to print them all out, especially since it wanted to give us so many digits of pi, it had to give a label. So here it's telling us, well, I started with the first value in the vector, and by the time I got to the second row of printouts, um, I was on the, up to the fifth element of that vector. So one thing I could do is use this vector that I've called vec4 as the input for a matrix. So if I use that as the input, but then say that I want two rows and two columns, what's going to happen? Well, remember there are eight values in vec4, but if I have two rows and two columns, there's only room for four of them. So if I do that and give it the name mat2 and then print out mat2, you can see it just used the first four values. It did not give me an error. So that's important to know. If you're trying to um, use an input to fill out um, the particular values in a matrix, um, you should know that it's going to cut off at the number of values allowed for that matrix.